Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles, the Friday podcast all about your Kindle. I'm Len Edgerly. Today is September 29th, 2017. Greetings from Ocean Park, Maine, which is, of course, a world away from New York City, where I reached this week's guest, Sarah Nelson. She's the former editorial director for Books and Kindle at Amazon, and for the past year, she's been working at the second largest of the big five publishers. I think publishers have some ideas about how Amazon feels about books, and I think Amazon has ideas about how little publishers know about the business of books, and I think that They're both wrong. I'll, of course, have lots to say about the new generation of Echo devices that was announced this week and how Google may have tried to cramp the style of the party a bit on Echo with a change that they made. Amazon released a a slew of new products this week. They had an event out in Seattle where they were previewed, and there's been a lot of coverage on it. And there's also information, of course, on the website. So I'm going to give you my impressions of the uh, products. I was not at the event. I probably would have loved to have gone, but uh, in truth, the expense of getting to Seattle and staying in a hotel and coming back, and all of the information is out there. So I've been to some of these events in the past. Uh, There weren't any new Kindle devices announced and I have a feeling if there's uh, some kind of a presentation on a new Kindle in the coming weeks I might get a chance to go to that so in any way it's all good it's uh, the, the fun thing is to talk about these d- devices to try them out and to get your reactions to them if once in a while I end up uh, being included with Wall Street Journal and TechCrunch and the rest of them for a, a media presentation that's all uh, sort of gravy to the operation So let's work through these devices. The first one is called the all-new Echo. It sells for $100. You can get three of them for $250. That would be $50 off. This replaces the Echo, which has been kind of the standard Alexa device ever since uh, the launch three years ago. It looks pretty sharp. It's 5.9 inches tall compared to 9.3 inches for the original Echo. It looks kind of like a big Pringles can. The new Echo has got six shell colors and finishes. You can choose from charcoal, sandstone, fabric. That's the one I chose when I ordered mine. There's a heather gray, an oak veneer, a walnut veneer, and a silver. So these these look pretty sharp. You know, at this point, the original Echo looks like kind of a lot of equipment to put somewhere in your house, and I think it's a smooth move to be making the footprint smaller. Actually, it's a little bit wider. The, it's 3.5 inches in diameter compared to 3.3 for the original, but it's it's much shorter and it weighs quite a bit less. It's thirty almost 30% lighter than the original Echo. With all of that, there's apparently better audio quality. There's a dedicated 0.6-inch tweeter, a 2.5 down-firing woofer, and Dolby processing. <laughs> Say what? Uh, these are terms I don't really understand, but what I'm assuming is that there. I hope that there's going to be a noticeable difference in the audio quality of this new Echo device compared to the old one, which the old one's pretty pretty good in terms of listening to music, and Darlene has been listening to an audible audiobook out in the room that she uses for doing her quilting here at the at the beach and it's just slick as anything she just tells the echo that we've got out there to read the book and that's how she stays in the room to to work on her fabulous quilts so i think this in hundred dollars this is uh the the original echo was 180 dollars, so they've trimmed uh, 80 80 dollars off the price and this is uh pretty uh, at least on paper, until we get our hands on it, a uh, notable advance in the technology of the kind of flagship item for the Alexa line. There is also an interesting one called the Echo Plus, and that's $150. Oh, by the way, the, the all-new Echo, uh, you can pre-order it now, and it will ship on October 31st. Same thing for the Echo Plus, the $150 unit. And that's basically like the Echo, except it has a built-in smart home hub, it's called. This is going to make it easy to connect your Echo Plus with uh, lights or if you've got a 
coffee maker that will respond to Alexa demands, all of the things in the home, uh, they're trying to make it easier to hook up. This, I think, is smart because I've, I've dabbled a little bit in these devices, and setting them up, you you have to, up until now, you've had to go into the Alexa app on the smartphone. I use my iPhone for that. And I haven't found it a a, a one click easy Amazon intuitive like process at this point. It was uh, a bit of a hassle to get it set up. So if they have streamlined this part of connecting devices to an Echo device, so that a civilian or someone who isn't sort of love technical problems like I do, and I know a lot of you do, uh, that's going to be a, a big advance in in having these devices be actually useful in the home. So the, the demo shows you you hook up your Echo Plus and you say, Alexa, discover my devices. And then she goes through her thing and says that they're, she's found all these devices and they're automatically hooked up. They, they are also including a Philips uh, Hue light bulb, which can be activated by Alexa, connects to the internet. So there's kind of a starter uh, bit of home tech that comes with the Echo Plus, also smart. Because I, I tell you, the we've got one set up here in the bedroom at the cottage, and I can say, Alexa, turn on the light. And it's just endlessly fun. It is like magic. And, you know, Darlene and I have been sort of playing around with it, which you'll hear about more in the interview. Uh, that's, I think, the, the natural starting place if you want to get a little adventurous and use your Alexa device for something more than what's the weather and, you know, set a timer for the uh, for cooking or something like that. And I can see how this moves t- forward toward, hmm, I wonder what else would be fun to have Alexa handle. As part of the rollout of these devices, uh, there are there's a new capability called Routines, and they show a guy uh, saying, Alexa, good morning. I think that might run up against the one that gives you the daily uh, notice that today is National Coffee Day. And if you say, Alexa, good morning, you'll find out about that. And there's a, they, they've got Alexa talking really fast as if she's had a double shot of espresso. Good morning. It's National Coffee Day. To celebrate, I'll be taking a double shot of processing power. Here we go. Oh boy, I think it's working. I feel like a hopped up jitterbug. Am I talking fast? I feel like I'm talking fast. Oh well, I'm here if you need me. Have an energized day. There must be a group somewhere, maybe it's in Cambridge, that is coming up with these daily messages from Alexa. A lot of times they're showing off, uh, you know, the, her ability to sing, and in this case, that speeded up speech. So uh, that would be a great place to have a job, I would think. So back to the new Alexas and this capability. The idea is you can name a set of Alexa commands like good morning uh, or start the weekend and it'll turn the coffee on, it'll turn the lights on, it'll start reading your news briefing, it'll do several different things just on on one command. Again, that's pretty clever and if you if it's easy enough to set up and it would be fun to do that probably would be a great I can see waking up and giving one of those commands and having all of these things happen and thinking man I really am George Jetson here this is this is a lot of fun so that echo plus uh, with the built-in smart home hub that's uh, uh, more expensive fifty dollars more than the basic echo the new echo plus is the same height as the original Echo 9.3 inches, so it's quite a bit taller than the new Echo 5.9 inches, and in some cases you that might seem like a lot to put somewhere, but if you want that extra home hub capability, smart home hub capability, you'd be getting a larger device to, to do it, and more expensive. The one that I think caught everybody's eye is called the Echo Spot, and it's one hundred and thirty dollars. It, it's it's positioned, and you can imagine it looking like a, an alarm clock that you'd put by the bed. It has a screen. It's only a two point five inch screen compared to seven inches on the Echo Show, and it, you can customize a watch face. So if you put it by your bed, it, it'll apparently act like a clock and i'm sure you can set an alarm to wake you up and when you wake up you can say turn on the light or start the coffee or all the other things now there is a camera on this so you know a camera in the bedroom that there's been a lot of uh, sort of titillation about that but the the basic idea of putting a device that's your first encounter when you wake up that that makes some sense to me it's a very attractive little thing it's a little round ball and it angles up it's uh 
you got four microphones so it's it's got you know the ability to talk to it across the room and it has an audio cable so you can plug in a more of a speaker if you want uh, the speaker i'm sure is much less than the other devices so you're going to have that sort of tinny sound that you have with the echo dot but uh, it doesn't. It also doesn't ship until December nineteenth. And on the website, some of the other products have videos demonstrating what all these do. And there isn't a video up yet for the Echo Spot. So I have a feeling the team that's was working on this is was really coming down to the wire to get it ready in time for Christmas. And it's just barely going to make uh, deliveries on December nineteenth if all goes well. Uh, I did order one of those. Of course, they come in black and white. I ordered the the white one. And uh, I think that's going to be pretty fun. It's $100 less than the Echo Show, which is the other video-enabled device. But it appears it's going to be able to do everything that the show can do. If you want to drop in on someone while you're still lying in bed, or uh, obviously you could have one of these on a desk as well. It doesn't have to go by the bed. Uh, it, it brings that whole video capability into a much more affordable device at uh, $130 compared to $230 for the show. The other item uh, is the Echo Connect, $35. The idea here, and this gets out a little past my... Uh, grasping the calling feature which is already built in you can use an echo device to call someone but this is going to plug into the landline you take your phone jack put it into the back of this little box the echo connect and then you can use any device echo device you've got in the house to make a phone call all of a sudden all of these echo devices essentially turn into speaker phones again I'm, i always think of my parents and how this might help them that if they were able to make a phone call hands-free from any of the echo devices that we've now got sort of spread throughout their house that's going to be pretty handy and and uh, also if a call comes into their phone number at the house on the landline the echo devices will say call from len and across the room m mom or dad will be able to say answer or pick up the phone or something like that and then just be talking to me uh the house that darlene and i are moving into in cambridge i don't i'm not sure we're going to have a landline so we we might not have a, a use for that but i did order one because i want to see how it's going to work uh, for my parents a couple of other items, uh, all new Fire TV, $70. Uh, it's smaller. I think it's got some capabilities that the existing Fire TV uh, doesn't have. I, I'm a bit behind the curve on that. I've, I've We use Fire TV. We've got the Fire TV stick working here at the cottage. But that's uh, if you have been waiting to get into Fire TV, that that's probably going to be a good one to try out. That ships on uh, October 25th. The last item is in the whimsical department, the buttons they're called, and it's going to be two for $20. You can't pre-order them yet, but I'll have a link in the show notes that takes you to where you can be notified when they do become available. Apparently they're little like round hockey puck things, and there's going to be Alexa games, a trivial pursuit, things like that. And and uh, you're going to be able to tap those buttons and make things happen uh, for for uh, play or who knows what. So uh, that's to be determined on what kind of uses that's going to be uh, put to. There's been lots of coverage of the events. Here is an entertaining bit by Jeffrey Fowler of the Wall Street Journal on the Tech News Briefing podcast. I get this link from David Enzel. This fall, Alexa is becoming an alarm clock, a TV remote, a smart home hub, and if you need an interactive buzzer for game night with the family, they even have that as well. Let's get more on Amazon's big Alexa strategy this fall. Joining us now via Skype on the road is the Wall Street Journal's Jeff Fowler. So Jeff, there's a half a dozen, at least, new smart Amazon devices busting out the gates. It's clear they just want Alexa everywhere, right? So let's start first thing in the morning, our, our bedrooms. That's where Amazon's hoping we'll use the Echo Spot, right? That's new. What's the deal with that? Exactly right. They want to be everywhere that you might possibly 
probably find some use for talking to a virtual assistant. And that starts by your bedside. So they've got this, this small little orb looking echo kind of looks kind of like an alarm clock and actually can serve as that. Obviously, you can ask can ask her to set an alarm for you and, and, it, and it'll work and then do other things. You could say, hey, show me last night's monologue from the uh, from the Tonight Show or use it also as a video calling unit to sort of check in with someone or as a system to intercom for your house. The bedroom is kind of a tricky place to go with technology, especially technology that has uh, not only microphones that are always on and listening, but also right. cameras. And this is where Amazon's really going to have to get some of these these details right. Um, you know, they have this other product, this other Echo product called The Show that also has cameras and a screen. And I felt like they kind of got it wrong there. And, and, and they risk doing it again here. This is this device. And you would think like, oh, I could just leave it as kind of an alarm clock. And yet, uh, from what they told me yesterday, at least not yet, you can't just always leave the screen on to show the time. They want to like pop up other Amazon kind of messages at you, both news headlines or like tips on how to use the thing. And to me, that's that's just going to get annoying. They also have to make it work right that like, are you supposed to set it on do not disturb before you go to bed every night so that somebody doesn't like call you in the middle of the night or, you know, butt dial you on your on your Echo. So, right. you know, they've got a lot of these kind of details to work out as they move to new places like the bedroom. Yeah, it makes me a little nervous, quite frankly. I, I generally appreciate Fowler's take on technology. I have to say I disagree with them on the suggestion that the Echo Show has got things wrong. I, I'm using it all the time with my parents, and the Do Not Disturb button is so easy to access. It's just a simple tap on the upper left of the device, and I see the buttons are going to be placed similarly on the Echo Spot. And, for example, if I'm working on the show and I, I can't be dropped in on, I just press that button, a red light shows, and it's off. So it's become very natural for me to just monitor that, and I would expect the same thing will be uh, the case with the Echo Spot. One thing which uh, they mentioned there about the you could wake up and ask the spot to show you the monologue from The Tonight Show, I think that might not be possible given a move that YouTube made this week where they eliminated the ability for the uh, show and now the the spot to be able to show YouTube videos. That was actually featured on that uh, long video introduction to the show where you might remember the grandfather is is trying to figure out how to do the sponge painting for his granddaughter's room so he just asks uh alexa to give him some information on sponge painting and uh, if you do something like that now let's try it we'll turn turn the show back on alexa find a youtube video on how to fix a toilet Currently, Google is not supporting YouTube on Echo Show. Well, uh, I have a feeling the way that was covered that they've been in negotiations for a while on exactly how the YouTube videos are going to show up in the show. And Google put out a thing saying that it was a degraded view of the uh, YouTube videos because you couldn't comment and different things. Uh, so I'm sure there's pressure each way, both uh, suggesting that their only interest is the customer. and uh, But it's a, a, a pretty important interface that reminds me of Amazon's negotiations with the book publishers. And at a certain point, Amazon you know, uh, deleted the buy button for Macmillan's books. And in this case, Google has kind of deleted the YouTube video link for the show. Uh, I suspect that was a point in the negotiations that was getting kind of acute. And I would hope that they will be able to figure out this connection and uh, that the show will be able to find videos the way it was uh, up until now. Google, Google has its own products coming out, I think, for the home. And uh, so there's a lot of moving pieces to the uh, positioning of these two big companies. Uh, but at this point, if you want to find out how to do sponge painting or uh, fix a toilet or make something in the kitchen, you're not going to be able to find it by searching for a video on your Echo Show. Uh, also in news uh, this week, uh, a couple of uh, new Amazon bookstores were announced, one in Austin and one in Washington, D.C. That's going to bring the total up to 15. Uh, t uh, those two are going to open in 2018. I stopped by the Linfield store on the way down to Boston on one of my trips this week and had a chance to spend a little more time there. And I, I tried that uh, thing on my iPhone where if I 
press the Amazon app, it does come up with a scan button. So it's very easy to scan items in. And that, that did work in the store very nicely. I was also spent some time uh, just seeing what's there. And I was really pleased to see there was such a strong display of comics and graphic novels at the store. This is something I've been experimenting with with my Comixology Unlimited subscription and and when i see these comics on the screen with the the way that you can move from panel view to panel view uh that's been my only experience of the comics so it was really nice to pick up some of these books like sega and uh, some of the others that i've been reading and see what they look like uh, in a bound volume in some ways there's some advantage i can see why people would prefer to read comics on paper but it was also just a chance to to get a physical feel for some of these uh, really popular comics and graphic novels there in the store, complementing the experience that I've had with them so far online. The staff at the Linfield Amazon Bookstore said they would not be getting any of the new devices until they actually start shipping. So you can't go to a store if you have one nearby and, and get your hands on them. One thing I came up with, a, an idea that I think would improve the experience in the store, I was wanting to look up a book to see if they had it in stock. And I, I realized that from the app there wasn't a clear place where I could uh, find the location of a book within the store. So I asked one of the staffers, and they said, well, no, that there isn't any way that you can do that on your smartphone. But she was able to tap in the book that I was looking for and found it right away. It was on one of the, the main racks. I, I would think that would be uh, pretty neat if uh, there was, again, it sort of goes back to the idea of a specific Amazon Books app that you could have, because if you were looking for a book and then it would say, all right, in this particular store, uh, the book you're looking for is on this table with a little map of the store or something like that. I think that would be a way to uh, enhance the the ability, the, the sense that you have when you're there is you can use your, your smartphone to buy things and uh, scan things. You're, it, it, you, it's pretty natural to have kind of an active use of the smartphone while you're in the store. So why not make it possible to find a book and figure out exactly where it's located? Time now for the interview. Sarah Nelson worked at Amazon for four years, heading up the group responsible for the Amazon Book Review, also known as Omnivoracious, as well as regular lists of recommended books in all categories. In 2016, she was recruited by HarperCollins to become the Harper Division's Vice President, Executive Editor, and Special Assistant to the publisher, Jonathan Burnham. In August of last year, three weeks after arriving at Harper, Sarah spoke with me for TKC 419 about her transition from Amazon to the second largest of the big five publishers. Since then, her job has evolved into two parts, which she described during the Skype and telephone interview that I recorded with her on Wednesday of this week, September 27th, from her office in Manhattan. I acquire my own books, and I'm also uh, working with some of the younger editors um, and uh, the other editors on uh, helping position their books and, you know, go, I go to all the cover meetings um, as a sort of um, overseer, you know, along with the publisher and uh, associate publisher. So um, so I have a kind of, you know, o overseeing strategy job as well as specific books. Um, and it's a lot. I mean, to tell you the truth, it's really a lot. So I have acquired about eight books in, a, in 14 months, um, which is... Uh, you know, it's a lot. Um, yeah. And I mean, sort of, I don't know what I expected. I, I, I mean, nobody gives you a quota. It's not like you have to acquire this many books by this date or anything like that. So, I mean, I have bought everything that I bought I love. And um, I mean, I feel like I had, you know, eight children in a year and 14 months. <laughs> um, none of the books that I bought have yet come out. I, I inherited something. I took something over that came out in May that was a, a wonderful little book of letters between Harper Lee and uh, a guy that she had a pen pal sort of relationship with for the last 20 years of her life. And it was, um, you know, it was just a... Um, a collection of letters back and forth and hmm. some introductory material. Uh, uh, and it was a good process for me because uh, I didn't acquire the book, but I uh, I did edit it and I, you know, went through the whole process of choosing a cover and doing all these things. And um, now, Did you say that you acquired eight books or 18 books? Eight. Oh, eight. Okay. And so are all of those active editing 
projects where, where you're spending time with the author and shaping it and the whole thing? Yes, I mean I am I am the the caretaker, the editor, the chief cook and bottle washer for all eight of those books. Um, and what that means differs from book to book. I mean, some of the books arrive fully formed, and some, I mean, everything needs something, but, but some of them are in, you know, perfect condition, and, and they just need a little copy edit and, uh, you know, a, a kind of once over with people. Others are sort of require somewhat more conceptualizing with the author sitting down and saying, you know, I don't think this section... You know, I think this section should move faster or this section should, uh, you know, uh, work on this or that or the other thing. So I've had a, a lot of different editing experiences. I mean, some really were just, you know, like, I think this paragraph's a little out of, out of you know, off focus or something. You know, that kind of comment to an author, you know, it's like, mm, look at chapter three and yeah. see if you can streamline it a little which is, you know, really very little to, to do. And, um, you know, two more substantial, um, you know, I think the pacing is off. I think we need to work on this. I think we need to, you know, introduce this character earlier or kill her off sooner or, or you know, whatever it is. Um, so uh, I had that experience, that, that kind of experience, too, with, with certain books. Do you know now uh, which, the nec- which one will be published next of, of the ones that you were working on? I do. Um, starting at the... Year in in February and March, I will have a a book at least one book come out every month between February and July. So some of them are paperback original in our Harper Perennial line. Some of them are hardcover, just Harper titles. Yeah. At this point, can you describe any of the books, or is it too soon to kind of reveal no, who sure. they are? And- I'm happy to. One of the interesting things that happened uh, in in um, the fir- the first year, um, and, and maybe will continue to happen, is I am seeing books, projects from agents by authors who I championed in my previous life. I mean, in other words, I may have promoted the books at Amazon, or I may have reviewed them when I was at Oprah, or I discovered them when I was at Publishers Weekly, or so that um, while I never acted as the editor on the, for those authors, uh, I was known to them and they were known to me. Um, so that was really fun. I mean, for example, there's a book um, coming out called The Dying of the Light, which is by a guy named Robert Goulrick, who wrote 10 years ago or something, nine years ago maybe, wrote a book called A Reliable Wife that was a huge bestseller. Um, for, uh, it was published by Algonquin. And I remember being given the manuscript of that book when I was at PW by an editor, uh, Chuck Adams, um, at Algonquin, who said, oh, I just bought this great book and you know, I thought you would like it and gave me a bound manuscript and I went home and I read it and I loved it and I wrote a column when I was writing my columns at PW, I wrote a column about how this, I think I had a line in it that said something like, a year from now, people are going to be lining up at the bookstore to buy this book. <laughs> but, you know, I loved it. And then they did. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and it was really exciting. I was like, oh, I told them to do it and then they did it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so when he had, and that was, he had several books since then, but so, so, uh, you know, he, he was very aware of, you know, my having done that obviously as any writer would be. And, um, and I, you know, I sort of felt some ownership of his career a little yeah. bit. So when he had a, you know, new agent and a new book and was no longer in, you know, contract with, uh, in option with, um, Algonquin, they brought it to me. Oh, great. They said, you know, you like this guy, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Send it <laughs> over, you know. So I bought that. And then almost exactly the same thing happened with another book called, which we're calling The Magnificent Esme Wells, uh, which is a novel by a woman named uh, Adrienne Sharp, who had written a novel that I raved about when I was at Oprah Magazine. And uh, so her agent brought it brought this new one to me and said, you know, I think you, you know, you once said you liked this, this woman's writing, you know, so, uh, and I very much remembered it because I had loved the other book. And so, so I bought that too, hmm. you know, so, I mean, that's just been really, really, really satisfying. And, um, to, to get to work on, you know, with people that I, you know, have already feel some connection to their previous books. Huh, that's fun. You said you, you work on covers at some of these meetings, and I'm sure you're working on covers with the books that you acquired. What is a conversation about a cover like when people sit around at a table and they're trying to figure out 
which cover is the right cover for a book. That that strikes me as a fairly mysterious process. It's completely mysterious to me, um, and I've been doing it, you know, weekly for a year now, 14 months. I mean, a lot of people have been doing it a lot longer than that, obviously, but... You know, I felt at the beginning, I really had never done that, so I felt at the beginning I really didn't know what I was talking about. Partly, you know, I was reading books so early in the process, you know, before they had covers, right? right? Because I was reading, you know, they might have a galley, but I was also reading a lot of electronic, uh, reading electronically, so I wasn't seeing covers. Mm -hmm. And I often had, had the experience you know, in my other jobs, of walking into a bookstore and seeing a cover for the first time, you know, six months after I'd read the book, yeah. right? And I'd be like, oh, that's why they put that <laughs> cover on, or, oh, that's what they did for that? You know, so I, I had no proximity to the press at all. And I was a little bit self-conscious the first couple of months when I was sort of looking at these, you know, beautiful drawings or illustrations or photographs or I mean, very talented art department and... um and they have, you know, concepts. And they say, well, we have three different concepts for this book. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and I would, you know, and I just decided to just sort of say what I thought. And it's interesting because I, I felt like I, and I still feel like I don't, I don't really have a visual vocabulary. Like I know I'll look at something and I'll say, this doesn't feel like the book to me. But I, I don't feel that I'm good at giving people directions saying, well, it needs to be more you know, dramatic, or it needs to be more, I don't know what, you know, it yeah. needs to... Blue. It, it should, it, yeah, it should have a <laughs> photograph instead of a drawing. I, mean, I don't know, it's sort of like, you know, the old line about pornography. It's like, show me a cover, if I like it, I'll know, you know, I'll know yeah. it when I see it. Right? right. So that's been a real learning experience, and, and the art director here has been very nice to me. I said to her one night, when we were at a, a social event, and maybe I'd had a glass of wine or three, and I said, you know, I feel like I just don't have the vocabulary to talk about this stuff. And she said, you know, it really doesn't seem that way. You seem to just sort of say what you think, and, you know, it's our job to interpret your words into the visual. Ah. So I thought that was extremely generous. Um, but, you know, meanwhile, I'm trying to be better. <laughs> yeah, they're using you as a sounding board, and, and they can tell how you're reacting to things, and it's probably useful. Right. A year ago, uh, I asked you what you thought you'd learned it for during your four years at Amazon that might be particularly helpful working at a publisher, HarperCollins. And I think, I think you wisely deferred that question and said, you know, I probably mm -hmm. will know in a year looking back mm -hmm. what the kind of essence of my Amazon education was. And mm -hmm. So I, I'm curious, to, given that a year has gone by now, and do you find yourself saying, well, I know that because I saw it at Amazon, or what, what parts of that part of your career seem to be most helpful to you now? Some very specific things like, uh, I mean, this is about covers too, but, but like, uh, it, you know, when I was in Amazon, I, I paid a lot of it. I mean, I, 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 we did everything online. And so, you know, we did the blog, Governor Voracious, they're still doing, and we'd put pictures of jackets up, you know, when we were interviewing an author or something. And when I got here and I was suddenly in these meetings talking about jackets, I would think, I would think, how is that going to look online? Right. How is that going to look, you know, on a blog, or how is that going to look even on the on the detail page? Uh, you know, in certain jackets that look really pretty when you're sitting there, or look really clear or whatever when you're sitting there, looking at them right in front of your face on on an actual book. You know, don't play online. That doesn't work. And so, that's a very specific thing that I think that I learned. Hmm. Um, I mean, I think that one of the things that I bring to this job is not so much, or, and bring to my colleagues at this job, is not so much, you know, this is how Amazon thinks about this, that, or the other thing, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, it's more, I hope it's more a sense of, I've been in this business from all sides, and we're sort of all in it together a little. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, if I if I if I have provided any bridge to um, you know now I'm sounding like you know but we're talking about you know President Trump and you know Kim Jong Il in here <laughs> in here um, I, mean, I don't mean to make it sound like that but you know that that there's some sense of um, you know 
I think that I think publishers have some ideas about how Amazon feels about books, and I think Amazon has ideas about how little publishers know about the business of books, and I think that they're both wrong, and I think I'm I'm the sort of personification of that. Like I, I when I was at Amazon, I was the person who knew everything about books and not that much about the business, and now that I'm, you know, because I hadn't been in the business side really, uh, and now I'm at at Harper, and I'm kind of the person who knows about how books get promoted and sold. Because I mean, there are other people here mm-hmm. too, but I, um, so I'm I'm kind of in in two camps all the time, and I think uh, I think that's mm-hmm. helpful. Well, and you might be helpful too because to the extent there's stereotypes uh, on each side when they look at the other side, you've actually worked with real people in both places, right? Right. Well, that's yeah. I mean, that's sort of what I was thinking. Um, but better, better you say it than I. I mean, I, I, about being a bridge. I mean, I feel like, um, you know, I, I I was a real person who was working at Amazon, and that's surprising to some people. And um, uh, yeah. and I was a book, you know, and I was a book person who was working at Amazon. So, uh, you know, I think if it, if right. it promotes mutual understanding, that would be good. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Well, do you hope that Amazon locates its second headquarters in New York City? Uh, I think it would be great for property values. Um, I uh, sure, why not? I mean, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, how many people has Amazon hired in the? When I, I may have told you this. When I started in Amazon in 2012, they said that they had 50,000 employees, and I don't know whether that was international or or just national, but it was the number was 50,000, and I think that included like the guys yeah. that worked in the warehouse. Um, and then when I left, the number was 250,000. So in four years. And now yeah. it has to be another whatever, right? So yeah. it's oh, incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. So, um, and, uh, you know, and I, I now I, I hear through the grapevine and I run into people who um, who I know from my, my non-digital life, my previous jobs, uh, and they're saying, oh, I'm applying for a job Amazon, or I'm, you know, or, I, or my brother is going to Amazon, or, you know, whatever. And, I mean, that's really changed. I mean, four years ago when I, five years ago now, when I went to Amazon, it was kind of like, um, you know, where is she going, right? <laughs> You're joining the Foreign Legion or something. Right, right. yeah, exactly. Well, and, and there are two Amazon bookstores in New York City, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What what's your what do you hear from your friends in the in- industry about about that? You know, I don't live anywhere near where the Amazon bookstore. The, there's only one, right? No, there are two. There's a second one now, right? They're sort of not on my general route, so I don't go to them. I have been to the one um, up in uh, um, at uh, at the Time Warner Center. You know, I mean, I remember when that one opened, people said surprised at how many books there were there and how many people were there and um, and that they appeared to be shopping because, you know, it's one thing to go into the store and another to shop. I mean, I, I don't, you know, New York, unfortunately, has too few bookstores all around, whether they're Amazon or, or Barnes & Noble or Independence. I mean, there are just not that many bookstores in New York anymore. And so I, I just, you know, I think it's great to have a bookstore. I, you know, now that I work in a, in a, um, in a publishing house, I actually go to bookstores less than I did before, which is weird, but I do. Why is that? Because I've got, sort of got a bookstore in my office. I mean, oh. I always kind of had a bookstore in my office, but I, you know, I, I felt I I felt like it was important for me to go out and see everything that was out there. And now I'm, you know, I'm more. I still am reading books, but you know, that other houses publish, but yeah. since I don't have to have quite the same overview that I used to have. Yeah, yeah. Part of your job uh, previously was sort of scanning the world of bookstores to see what's right. happening, and right. uh, now you're trying to make things happen in bookstores by having them sell your books. Exactly. So, and you know, and I miss I miss having the overview a little bit sometimes. Hmm. Um, you know, my friends are a little annoyed because they used to always ask me, you know, what should I read? And I think I... Well, I don't know. I read five submissions last week, but um, but I said, you know, a year from now, 
I'll, you know, when other people are published, you know, when books are coming out, I will have read them if I if I publish them or I consider them for publication or something. So, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I am I am do not lack for reading material. Let's put it that way. Yeah, for sure. Well, one thing that's happened since you left Amazon is they they kind of created their own bestseller list, this Amazon charts where right. they're tracking mm-hmm. not only books they're selling the best, but books that are being read the most. Uh, Right on Kindle. Yeah. What What do you see in that? Is that uh, any kind of a significant change in the discovery tools that are available to people, or how does that look from your view? I don't know. I mean, I look at it. You know, I I, I mean, I, I I don't know how how much consumers are looking at that. Um, I mean, I look at it, but I mean, I look at every bestseller list I can find. You know, I look at every every awards list and every. You know, I mean, that's you know that's what we do right mm-hmm. um i don't i don't know how it's making an impact for for regular readers for, mm. for civilians yeah what do you think i like that i can see what people are reading and the extent to which it differs from <laughs> what they're buying there there's sort of mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. there's a, mm-hmm. a a view of things there that fits my own thing i sometimes i buy books and i never get to read them but there are books that right sure the minute i buy it i got to read it so that's been one aspect I've enjoyed. A couple of other questions, just sort of curious about how things are being adopted. Are, are, is there an Alexa in your home? I have to turn mine off when I mention her name. Uh, I do have an Alexa, yes, though she's not. I bought it for my um, husband for Christmas, and we didn't really program it. I mean, it's not. she's not tremendously programmed, so uh-huh. she's not able to. I mean, she's able to tell me the weather and, you know, various basic things, but um, I just haven't had the... Um, time to sit down and really, uh, uh, re- you know, really sort of think about what I would want her to be programmed with. Um, I-, I find it a little creepy, I have to say. <laughs> I-, I just, I mean, I mean, Sam and I, my husband and I make fun of, uh, we, we so it just, you know, when you want to just like be mean to somebody, you know, you just want to like, get your frustration. So, you know, well, uh, Alexa, you're really dumb. Yeah. <laughs> that is not a nice... Sometimes she'll say, it depends what you say, but that is not a nice way to speak to me. I know, I, think, I know. Yeah, but I feel so much better after, you know, insulted her because I've never talked to a human being that way. Um, so... Well, I think the pro- the programmers, I think, are aware of some of these odd uses because I, I have the one here can turn on the light. So my, my wife, Darlene, was, was just sort of messing with me and she would tell... Uh, Alexa to turn off the light if I just turned it on. And so I said, Alexa, don't listen to Darlene. And she had this comment, this, her very calm voice, she was saying, uh, it's been my practice to listen to everybody who addresses me. <laughs> <laughs> so she thought Alexa had sided with her in our, our, our sort of ridiculous fight. That's but very funny. Yeah, very it, it gets funny. inserted as kind of a presence to whether we want yeah, it or it's not. It's weird. It's a little weird. Yeah, it? yeah, it totally is. Uh, how about uh, what are you watching on for TV shows these days when you're not reading a book? Well, I you know I really have never I don't watch a ton of things. I I, um, I mean I'm you know a very late binge watcher. I mean a year ago, right before I started this job, I spent a week watching Mad Men. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, obsessively watching Mad Men to the point where my son just graduated from college <laughs> said to me. Mom, you know these people aren't real, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and so I had to get home to see, you know, what Don was doing tonight. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I watched The Crown. I was watching The Americans. I watched uh, Big Little Lies. I watched. Um, I have not never seen Game of Thrones. I know I'm going to be thrown uh-huh. out of the country or something. Okay. You know, I watch a lot of news now. Mm, yeah, that's, that's that's something that's changed in the last yeah. nine months. That's just gobbling up yeah. a lot of time. Well, yeah. and I'm guessing you haven't had much time to return to any kind of writing. You were doing a lot of writing when you were at Amazon and, of course, earlier in yeah. your career. It's actually something I miss. Um, I, I, um, I write jacket copy. I've written, um, I writ- wrote a letter to go with one of my books. I miss writing, and mm. I would like to try to find a way to write more. Is there any kind of a, a novel nibbling at your psyche that you could see mm. writing in five years or something? Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Anything else that uh, you're working on you'd like to talk uh, mention that we haven't discussed so far? No, I mean I'm um, I'm always happy to talk about my books, but um, 
you know, and I'd love to do it, you know, six months or a year from now yeah, again. Yeah, you bet. And I'll put links to uh, Harbor Collins has. A, oh, and by the way, it's uh, the 200th anniversary of Harbor Collins. I saw. So That's correct, it is. You got 200th some. anniversary. Yep. That's amazing. 1817. So, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, happy birthday to you and everybody there. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> Take care. That's it for this week. Next week's guest will be Stephen Ingram, a photographer who lives in nearby Kennebunk, Maine. He published a useful book titled Point and Shoot Nature Photography. I heard about Stephen's work from a high school friend of mine, Steph Matledge, who helped set up our rendezvous, which will take place at Stephen's home in Kennebunk next week. Thanks in advance. If you purchase any of the new Echo devices starting at thekindlechronicles.com and clicking on the Amazon ad, that helps out with associates' commissions. This is Len Edgerly for the Kindle Chronicles from Ocean Park, Maine. I really appreciate your taking the time to listen to my show. Have a great day. Bye.